We're still prepping for the latter rain, so here we are on part three, which I thought was going to be a part one sermon, and it's going to be at least part four, because I ain't finishing this this week either. <laughs> so, praise his mighty name. He's just opening it up, and uh, I'm thinking I'm going to take my notes, compile them, and uh, I'm not going to, you know, like some of the, because I do an awful lot of ad-libbing, and I'm not going to put the ad-libbing stuff in the uh, in, in the notes, but... Uh, I'll uh, make a uh, maybe I'll make another or add this as a link to the uh, the latter rain page on the website because I already have a couple three sermons on there, uh, but I got a little dissertation on there too. But then I'm going to link out all three or four parts uh, because I get a lot of questions about the latter rain from people, and it's like uh, I mean there's just so much to cover. You know, it's just. Uh, I mean, it's not like it's not a it's not a study like uh, Michael, or or, or even uh, what was the other one? It was kind of because Michael, you can't just uh, or the Godhead. There was a meaty one. There was another one though. You can't just answer it with one Bible verse. No. If I remember, it'll come up later. But this one here uh, is like I say, it's part three, and. Um, when we look around and uh in today's world and it's just so so very strange and it's going to be overwhelmingly strange the last two weeks of plague six because everybody that's going to surround us if we're in that number you know the 144 well odds are you're going to be in the number okay not necessarily of the gideon band but you got that special resurrection that happens right before then because sister white did say something to the effect i got to look up the exact quote that um uh, her and anybody else that was involved in the three angels message that dies before uh, the plague's end will resurrect to be able to take part in drinking that cup in plague six and so that's going to be a pretty intense situation but having the latter rain all uh, on you you're not going to worry about something like hey is that really Ellen White or is it a demon acting like Ellen White is going to mess with us no you're going to have the latter rain upon you so you're going to have a lot clearer eyes, <laughs> a lot less, uh, your sunglasses are, are going to be nowhere to be found. And so, like all the churches today that, you know, that do in fact believe in the second coming, they have made a pretense of following the Lord, just as Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 predicted most are going to do. And uh, none of them have purposely watched and prayed with a faith that only comes from sitting at the feet of Christ in prayer and study on a daily basis, which then purifies the soul and grants the faith needed to stop known sin, which then helps us to make our path straight for the coming of the Lord. I mean, if you really get into the scriptures, because uh, I remember when I um, first found the Lord, I was still Sunday keeping and stuff like that. I think drinking and smoking was uh, bad. And uh, drinking, for something, even though I drank like a fish, I didn't. that wasn't hard for me to give up because I was mostly addicted to the action. I, I wouldn't sit at home and just drink. I know people, some of my brothers do that. Come home from a hard day's work, crack open a six-pack and watch some TV. I can't, I couldn't never, no, I couldn't do it. And so uh, it was easy for me to quit the drinking. But the cigarettes was a little more difficult, even though I had quit them previously. But then when I got more and more and more into the study and getting closer and closer and closer to Christ, uh, he literally one day, this was the second time in my life I heard the still small voice, but in one day, bam, I became a non-smoker. So I know, and it was literally tested twice within uh, 48 hours to try to get me to smoke. And both times I thought, praise the Lord, I don't even have an urge. You know, and one guy actually handed me, no, both guys handed me a cigarette. One of them had it lit, and the other one just spilled them all, and I helped him pick them up, and he handed me one like he had never done before in his life. And it was just amazing. I was just proud. And so that same, you know, that'll work for, you know, Anybody that's into heroin or cocaine or marijuana or alcohol or porn and anything, you know, all of it. And so, but these poor souls in these apostate churches have lived a life of carelessness while claiming at the same time to be Christians because their fallen pastors have led them into an apostate position or state as if it's no big deal. They all know. I mean, take the SDA church, and I always got to use this as an example because they were the true church at one time. They were the ninth hour movement. It's right there in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 7. And then you see it again in Revelation 12, 17. They're the woman. The remnant of her seed, that's us. The ones that leave the SDA church to finish the work. 
And that upsets them. Why? Well, go back to Matthew 20. <laughs> After they get done doing the work of the day, you know, the Lord gave us the same blessing he gave the people that did the work before us. And they got all upset. Well, that's why they get upset with us now. He says, how come you're getting the blessings? Uh, we worked all this time. You've only been a little while, and you're getting all these blessings. Well, you know, because you stopped doing the work. Nothing you can do about that. And so, but i got to use them as an example because all the other churches out there, yeah, they've been apostates since birth. You know, with the exception of maybe, uh, uh, you know, guys like, uh, Martin, like you know, Luther and then Wesley and all these, because they got infiltrated and got all messed up, you know, later on. But a church known, like the SDA church from its infancy to understand prophecy and the symbols it contains, it's, uh, it's the very one that's seven... Uh, the very one that their church, you know, the SDA church, the very one that they uplift as a prophet. How did they, see they, they they forget these things that she says? But they and they actually delete them from her writings. That's why I got a page on the website all about the edited books of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and I got thirteen videos about it as well. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of making another video because the Sister of the Faith reminded me of the fact that. Uh, um, I think it's in the Great Controversy, either the 1911 or the 1888, or both for all that matter. But uh, in there, they changed what it says in the 1884, where in, when Christ comes at the Second Coming, the 1888 and the 1911, one of them or both, say that Jesus Christ literally touches the earth. Why? Well, because the Jesuits are running in the SDA church. They've got to get the people ready for Antichrist. They've got to make them think that that's Jesus. Because you've got to think about it. When they surround us at the end of Plague Six they're going to think they're Christians, even though they're there to kill us. But no, notice what she says here in Christ Object Lessons. You're going to have to scroll down here on uh, the, uh, in the notes on the screen for the, those people in the stream. It's on the bottom. Uh, this is one that, you know, they, they won't even acknowledge that she stated. It's in Christ Object's Lessons, uh, page 178, paragraph 4. She says, Concerning Babylon, the symbol of the apostate church. He says to his ministers of judgment, her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Okay, that's specifically talking about the Vatican, right? Because we know Babylon has fallen, is fallen. But the fact, the point I'm making is right here. Can I highlight? Yeah, okay, good. I can highlight because I'm actually using this like a... Oops, I can't move it, though. <laughs> well, okay, I just highlight the word Babylon there on the stream. But um, she's saying that if your church is in apostasy, you are considered Babylon. Now, granted, they're not the Babylon. I mean, there's some SDA pastors out there that have boldly lied and said that I say the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the horror of Babylon. Never said that. I mean, I built search engines into both my websites. The one on Remnant God, of course, is a little beefier, because over 15,000 pages, but you go to the SDA apostasy one, that's my old one. Put in there anything you want to say about Babylon, and you'll never find a single statement of me saying that. I say it's a sister to fallen Babylon, because that's what it is. They, I mean, every SDA leader and every church member will admit their church is in apostasy. They'll also agree that Sister White is a prophet. But like the Catholics, they deny her the inspired word. The SDAs do the same with the Bible and spirit of prophecy when it speaks of their actual fruit in these last days. And still, they claim to be the remnant who will be blessed with the latter rain in the coming days when the truth is, unless they leave the SDA church, like the prophecy says in Revelation 12:17, they're going to be shaken out of the true remnant church and die in the plagues. They take Sister White out of context left and right, saying that she said, never leave the church. She was talking to me. You know, the word church isn't always SDA church when she uses it. When you read it in context, you'll see she's talking about the obedient ones. But I don't want to get all that because that'll just I'll just be going on for hours. But this is what makes our work so hard. Many of the people we meet in the near future will be convinced, not just convinced, but convinced, by the many false prophets they call pastors that they are in the true church. Even when they surround the Gideon band at Armageddon, it is not until we begin to glow right before their eyes that they're finally going to realize that they were actually the prophesied wicked souls that hated the God of the Bible all along. 
Self-deception is an essential tool in Satan's bag of tricks, and boy, does he work well there. As, as Christians, we know that all ten virgins have heard and agreed with the truth in the doctrine and in the prophecies. But five of them have never brought it into their practical life, other than to proclaim Christ's Lord with their lips, when it benefits them the most. You know, go, to the, go, go to church on Sabbath so as to have an appearance of obedience unto mankind and perhaps even tie the here or tie the required tithe there, and then they think they're headed home to heaven. The world is just too enticing for them to get truly serious about their walk so as to prepare for the coming of the Lord. And so the oil of the merciful and gracious Holy Spirit is not found in their lamps because they made their choice to leave them behind. They got better things ahead of them. You know, kind of like Ananias and Sapphira. You know, if this thing ain't working out, you kind of have to have a stash here. You kind of bury this somewhere, right? And therefore, they are not prepared to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb when that day finally arrives, which is getting extremely close now. Think about it. If the Pope gets his way in 2027, we're going to be going out with a loud cry in the next two or three years. We don't know. It's going to be in less than six. You ought to know that, right? Because if he gets his way in 2027, it's only to try to shut us up that he's doing it. Satan will already have appeared as, as, as Jesus by this time. That's going to happen within six years if, in fact, they get their way. I keep saying it. I'm not giving you no days or hours like... Uh, like, uh, what is the the guy, um, Pastor Gates? Well, I don't know if they call him a pastor anymore, but uh, I don't know. Was the Seventh Day Adventist pastor that was setting dates, saying that uh, the rapture or, or the, 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 the Sunday laws were going to start happening, rather, uh, in the spring of 2019. And st people still defend this man. He's a confirmed false prophet now. And they still, uh, what was his, I can't remember the guy's first name for some goofy reason. But anyway, the people aren't going to be prepared for the marriage supper of the land when that day finally, finally arrives. Uh, and students prophecy know for a biblical fact that commences when the eastern sky splits as Plague 7 destroys all the dis disobedient people on earth regardless if they're Christians or not. And why Plague 7? Well, because of what went down the last two weeks of Plague 6. The Lord's coming to, you know... You know save us from the the, the horrors surrounding us uh, like he did for David you know he uh, allowed the angel to guide that little stone into Goliath's forehead so the Lord comes to rescue us and he uses the power and, and think about this too and I'm, I'm going to be working on this in this sermon Pro, um, the comet Enki they're predicting its tail is going to sweep over the uh, the uh, the orbit of our planet in the year 2030. <laughs> All right, and in that tail, they're saying there's a 20 mile ball of hail, you know, plague seven. And the Pope wants a one world government by 2030. You know, a lot closer than people realize. But if people don't open up their Bibles, like let's say there's somebody listening to me right now, and they're a little shocked, their hearts beating, and their chest real heavy. If you don't stay in your Bible from this day forward. In a week or two, you're going to forget about all what I said. It's kind of like when the Twin Towers fell, and a bunch of people called, one of my brothers called me, that I, and I've been disowned, but yet one of my brothers called me because he knows, knows uh, that I have always been into prophecy, even as a child. And um, he's, he asked me, he said, uh, what's up with this Twin Towers? He's, he wanted to know if it was prophesied. And then within a week or two, it was like, yeah, yeah everything went back to normal, no big deal. Get in the Word. That is your path home. Basic instructions before leaving Earth. B I B L E. And so, but I believe this is. There's another reason Satan moved the Jesuits of Rome to fabricate this secret rapture uh, theory for those that only offer Christ lip service so as to embrace the world full tilt. It, you know, as they barely walk to the Lord at all, as the precious and the sorely deceived. You know, Roman Catholics were ta taught to do since their youngest memories can attest to. I, I know for a fact, being an ex-Catholic, you're taught from day one that you can be saved in your sins and not from your sins. You can never overcome. That's why the priests all and smoke and, you know, do some really strange things. Just like the prophet Daniel said they would do. He said that they would be homosexuals. And so sin... All you want is what their, their their theology is, but 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 make sure to either get to confession each week, 
so that you don't die with those sins in your body. Even though you're not confessing them to the Lord, you're confessing them to some pedophile. And if you're a child, he's tagging you. Okay, what kind of sins is this little kid having? And uh, and what kind of a mindset does the kid have? Am I going to be able to easily manipulate him? And just by hearing this kid confess his sins, he's going to, oh boy, there's an easy one. And then he'll tell him, you need some, you know, some instruction from me. And he'll get the parents' permission and everything to get private instruction. Or turn him into a, an altar boy, like they did to my brother. And so, but I did, again, this is not why I started Presence of God Ministry. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. I didn't know about my brother getting molested until decades after. And so, again, they're saying, sin all you want, just make sure you get to confession each week, or wear a scapular, a scapular around your neck in case you die. It's some piece of cloth um, that uh, Simon Stock, supposedly a saint, had a vision, and a demon calling itself Mary handed him a piece of brown cloth and told him the theology behind scapulars. And so the popes to this day wear them. As a matter of fact, when John Paul II got shot, they said he told the surgeons while they're working on him, he says, do not cut that scapular off. And he's a pagan. That's his God. I mean, he, these rituals, that's all it is. So this false prophecy of the secret rapture, and I mention this because of the way in the times we're living in, and, and that's another thing too. Those people that believe in the seven-year trib and the secret rapture and all this other stuff, a lot of what the false prophets taught them about the secret rapture that was supposed to happen after we left the planet have already been confirmed to have occurred and been fulfilled. But still they preach a false you know, rapture. And so, But anyway, the secret rapture is designed to make them rest their man-made faith on the impossible, to authenticate a possibility that they will be removed from the earth before Jesus Christ returns. And so they kick back and just claim Christ Lord while at the same time embrace all that the world has to offer, and especially behind closed doors when they assume no one is watching. Oh, oh, unless they think it's their dead grandmother watching. I got to tell you, when, when I um, uh, I was still a Catholic at the time, I was running a uh, fast food pl place called Brown's Chicken. I was the boss there, and uh, they uh, the, the owner's son died, and this is not that long before I uh, left the Catholic Church and then started really studying the Word. When he died, I felt bad about staying there because. Uh, you know, I was doing some unethical things with the business, and uh, and I thought he was looking at me from heaven. <laughs> and I, what if he's watching me from heaven or something like that? And I thought, uh, but because I was raised to believe that Falderall, and it's locked in a lot of people's hearts. That's why it worked so well when Fatima happened, when a demon calling itself the Lady of the Rosary or or you know the Virgin or the Virgin Mary that she finally called herself Mary because uh, she was you know the demon was testing the kids and the people in the area. Uh, and, and it's no mistake, it started happening two years after Ellen White died, because she would have pointed that one out with no problem. So when their sins are finally shouted from the rooftops at the end of the thousand years, just moments before they turn into ashes under the soles of our feet, they will know that every secret sin was not only seen by the Lord, the angel with the inkhorn wrote down every graphic detail of every single unconfessed sin. And there's a reason I'm sharing all this. Because it has to do with how we're prepping for the latter rain as well. They're so off the path to even getting near to prepping, we have to, we know we got issues in life too, you know. Uh, as some of us, you know, when you walk with the Lord as long as you do, even what some people would call a piddly sin tears at us big time. And praise God for that, because that's more and more evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you. But at the same time, when you think of that, you see these poor souls out there like the Catholics and the, all the other ones that literally have no desire to get ready for what's happening um, there's a reason you got this burden we'll try to warn them and, and so but they're just they're, they're, it's the Isaiah 4 1 thing you know they're putting on all like the crosses on their bodies uh, uh, you know and all the denominations are doing it now they wear the crosses they recite canned prayers they even echo the Gregorian chant to go to a church on Sundays uh, they celebrate the pagan holy days which they change to holidays uh, uh, there's, you know, it's always been holy days pagan holy days uh, they genuflect they beat themselves bloody on pagan holy days and uh, erect statues of people saints they fast during the pagan days of Lent 
and even make the sign of the Roman cross of torture on their body so as to appear, you know, appear holy unto all that look on them. And, they, and when they do the cross on their body, as I even made a video about this and traced it on camera and showed everybody that, uh, yeah, when you put that, when you make the, when you touch your forehead, you touch your, in the middle of your chest and you go left shoulder, right shoulder, unless, you're, unless of course, you're orthodox, you go right shoulder, left shoulder. It's upside down. It's an upside down cross every time you do it. And so, but check out what Isaiah twenty nine thirteen says here. I'm going to scroll back up so you can see the verses again. Isaiah twenty nine thirteen. Wow, I forgot to put a space between them. Sorry about that. But uh, let me see if I can highlight it for you there. There, there. Let me see the little thirteen there. Okay. All right. So, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of. I mean, just think of Catholicism and their purgatory and their hell, eternal life and hellfire. You know, the fear toward me is taught. In other words, they make God look like a tyrant. But instead of doing as the Lord says in the Scripture to make their path straight, so as to be ready for the coming of the Lord with lamps well trimmed, they choose rather to obey mankind's interpretation of their manufactured Christian faith by performing the pagan rituals of Rome, because. It's so much easier to do so while you're still in sin. You don't have to give anything up. And all the while, in other words, you don't sacrifice anything. Yeah, that's you know, we don't have to do the burnt offerings anymore, but boy, do we got to sacrifice things that we desire. That's part of, you know, passing the test. And so all the while, claiming they, they, they do this, they feel vindicated and sanctified at the same time to declare, and, and to be declared followers of Jesus while doing so be because the flagrant pomp and circumstance of Rome and their impressive cathedrals with all their scarlet robes, their scepters, their repetitive chain, their multicolored candles, their pipe organs echoing through the halls, I mean, their stinking of billows of incense of the witch. Yeah, that incense they burn is the same incense a witch burns when she does her incantation. I think it's sandalwood. But instead, and they do this inside their magnificently decorated pagan altars bathed in the finest fabrics known to man with 24 karat gold chalices, you know, big cups, it's a chalice they call it. And they do this to appeal to the eyes, to make it easier to ignore the heart. It's kind of like that verse that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, that from Ecclesiastes that we read earlier. Appeal, you know, things you, you think you want and things you need. You don't need them. I mean, these, these poor souls that never open a Bible believe this must be the proper way because they already have a heart towards loving the world from birth anyway and it's all they know and so that's how they were raised they believe this is truth and praise God for his mercy because there are some Catholics and SDAs and all the rest that are still going to make it to heaven because the Lord winks at their ignorance they don't know they're in danger but those of you that hear the truth as it's presented by the real remnant church, because you can't be the ninth and the 11th hour church at the same time. The SDA church cannot be the remnant church. Even Ellen White said so. You've got to leave that church to be of the remnant, period. End of story. Scripture says it. Spirit of prophecy says it. No getting around it. But they don't read Scripture, and they don't read Spirit of prophecy. Well, if they read Spirit of prophecy in the SDA church, it's always going to be edited. That's why I did those videos. But seriously, when the most worldly display is presented to the people by the prelates of Rome or any other church, to them it is an absolute confirmation that what they're looking at must be holy. Even though each and every one of them will admit the Catholic Mass is one of the most boring 30 minutes ever spent by every Catholic alive. I was Catholic 29 years, and that accounts for being at Mass hundreds upon hundreds of times because you went every week and every holy day of obligation. Devout as I was, and especially the last few years when my wife and I went to daily Mass, and a lot of times my mom would tag along, I would admit to even a priest that the Mass was mind-numbingly boring. Yet, because I was taught from my first memories as a little boy, it was my duty to attend as, to, as it would guarantee me eternal life regardless of its mundane rituals. I went. You know, our Lord said this long ago in Deuteronomy 12, verses 29 to 32. And the reason I'm bringing up the Catholic Church is because was it Neil C. Wilson said that there's another Catholic church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he's, that's the truth. That's why I did that uh, Roman SDA uh, page on my website many years ago before Flash went belly up. I had an animation that was made out of Flash. And that's where two SDA ministers try to get me uh, arrested. Uh, they've 
drummed up some, you know, in other words, it, would, it, it all failed 100%. They, they, they tried to use copyright infringement or something like that. I can't remember 100% what it was, but it's because on 5,000 pages I had on the site at that time, it was much smaller back then, it, uh, there was one page that showed how the Roman Catholic says, the Roman Catholic Church leaders say this, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church leaders also say this. And that video or that, that, that uh, animation went on for, I think, uh, 45 minutes. could have gone on for hours because I had that much data, but I was done. <laughs> it was long enough. But anyway, Deuteronomy 12, verses 29 30 to 32 says, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them. After that, they be destroyed from before thee. In other words, don't follow them because that's why they were destroyed. And that's why you can take their land, right? And going on it says, And that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hateth, hath they done unto gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Yet over 86% of Roman Catholicism is adopted by paganism. And the Jesuits admit this in writing, as I have shared so many times before that I'm not going to share again, because there's no sense in me reading the same quotes over and over again. But I got them on the words of a beast page if anybody wants them. And so every single Protestant church on earth, including the Seventh-day Adventist church, also does the same things Rome does when it comes to worshiping the false gods of Rome, from the pagan holy days to their pagan day of worship of the sun god, Baal, on Sunday. The SDA church has dozens of Sunday-keeping churches. And so everywhere we look, and this includes inside the Ninth Hour Church, all those claiming Christ's Lord now openly seek after the pagan gods to the point they even celebrate their holy days of obligation, like Xmas, Easter, Ash Wednesday, can you believe it? I saw a video out there of uh, inside a Seventh-day Adventist church doing Lent. Purple colors and all. And boy, was it dismal. They, they did not have enough light in that room. But uh, they also celebrate Valentine's Day, the Sunday Sabbath, as if the Lord is pleased with them when they do this. They openly ignore the warnings of Deuteronomy 12, as if it was never written in the Bible at all. You know, Well, for them it hasn't, because they don't read it. See, that's one of the sad things about reality here. I mean, the Lord specifically says, don't do what all the churches are doing. And if we, the people of God, do so th the same things, you know, such things, how will we be ready for the latter reign of the Creator God when we are living our lives as those that worship the God of the pagans? These holidays or holy days used to be called pagans. Uh, it used to be the pagans' holy days. And that is why the, they changed it from holy days to holidays to try to, you know, cover that up too. Now, so now do you see why it's so important to study His Word every day? The elect cannot be deceived because the Bible warned them what not to do, so as to be ready for God's blessings when He sends them. Because he's, that latter rain's coming soon. We got to get on the same page, all of us. Uh, you know, we, we got to be in one accord, just like the apostles were when the, the early rain fell on them. Remember that night. And, or the, uh, the day of Pentecost, the, what they call the, the day of Pentecost. Our God's word teaches us the difference between Christianity and paganism, just as easily as it teaches us the difference between right and wrong in all aspects of life. We are his children, and he will do all he can to guide us home. But if we refuse to be with him in, every day in study and in prayer, the light on our path is just going to go out. When it, when it gets really scary out there, we're going to be stumbling all over the place. We're going to be guided by fear and the flesh instead of being guided by the creator of the flesh who promised us peace. And so we might have a knee-jerk reaction to go do this or go do that without having a sermon from the Lord that says, you do that, you'll end up dying and your family will die with you. Because that's how crazy the times are getting now. And have you also noticed, thanks to the way Satan uses paganism to twist reality by lying about the creator God most fear the ever living and ever loving God of heaven thinking he's a tyrant like the pagan gods because most religions now bow their gods from Rome you know in regards to just false you know like the false doctrines like purgatory wherein even the faithful ones the ones that are headed to heaven no less they have to float in the fires of purgatory for millions of years never once stopping to take a break 
because they're going to be screaming in pain the whole time. That is the ultimate doctrine of a card-carrying devil worshiper who wants to make you think he's a Christian to get you to deny Jesus Christ and burn in hellfire, even though he thinks he's going to rule in hellfire. Satan's always been lying, even to the people that worship him, you know. But you could see that. I mean, why invent something like purgatory unless you want to make God look like he's a tyrant? That Purgatory never made sense to me. I can understand hell, yeah. You deny Christ as Lord, you go to hell. But I still didn't understand living for all eternity in hellfire screaming at the top of my lungs. And then when I read the Bible and find out there's not a statement anywhere from Genesis to Revelation that says you're going to be alive in that hellfire for eternity... I mean, the fact that we're going to be walking on the ashes of the people that die in hellfire proves it's going to end. <laughs> it's going to end eventually. But for most people, especially if they haven't done anything bad to Christians, yeah, they'll just <sighs> gone like a vapor when that fire comes from above and below. You know, when they start walking towards the city after it had descended onto the planet and we're inside the city watching all this as we're looking down from the walls above. And why do you watch? Well, for the same reason that when you stone people in Moses' day, all the, all the people of Israel had to stand up and look down and watch their judgment fall upon them because it makes them realize, hey, I can be here if I don't clean up my act. Well, it actually was just a prophetic utterance of what's going to happen because no one's going to have to clean up their act in New Jerusalem. So what they were doing back in Moses' day was just a prophetic echo. Backwards, however, <laughs> because that's what's going to happen in the future. We're all going to be looking down on them as they get their judgment. And so... The doctrine of eternal health, life and health fire in the Protestant churches was first believed by the pagans of ancient Rome, which is no different than the eternal life and purgatory of the pagan. For some reason, they decided to use both in the Catholic Church, which, you know, it's just Catholic gods is all it is. And so in both cases, the people are commanded to give lip service and do good works, pay indulgences, perform many strange rituals, and keep holy days of obligation so as to be to as to appease the anger of the Lord before dying, because if you do that, you'll have some hope in your heart that a few centuries of burning will be removed from your millions and millions and millions of years in purgatory fire. Yeah, I do have a video just about purgatory if you want to check it out. And so they are even taught, the Catholics like the Muslims, to beat themselves bloody in public parades of bloodletting each and every year claiming it shows how they deny the flesh when in fact they are doing exactly as the flesh commands to make it appear to make them appear holy. They're hurting themselves to make... It's kind of like, you know, the guy that stands on the street corner, like Jesus said, you know, don't preach like... or don't pray like they do out... Uh, the ones that seek self-glory. Standing on the street corners and praising God and praying and stuff like that. Because they already got their reward. They wanted people to look at them and says, look at how holy I am. And so, yeah, these people whip themselves and they get all bloody on the back and the, the Muslims do the same thing. The Muslims even do the thing on the head with a knife. You say, look at me, look at me, look at how holy I am. I'm blood laying all over the place. But the Catholics do it for the pagan goddess of Rome who is called the Oster, or, or as most call her today, Easter. And the Muslims do it for their holy day of Ashur, wherein they mourn the death of Muhammad's grandson for some strange reason. And so those of us that strive on to perfection know, we know, that we cannot take for granted the promises of our God as if they are ours unconditionally so as to make so as so you know, like all the other people do I mean the, G, the, the Jews tried that way of living uh, you know striving onto perfection you know, so as to be, look good onto God in other words if you're just a Jew you're guaranteed heaven kind of a thing um, they tried that for and they're still doing it to this day and look at how it ended up and so the Catholics believe that they're guaranteed heaven simply because they're Catholics the Jews believe that they're chosen people because of their ancient past, and so they don't need to prepare at all. And the SDA people literally state in writing more than once because they are in a church that they believe was named by God, which was the same as Israel was thousands of years ago yet, just as the Jews are no longer worthy, nor are the SDAs worthy now. But they won't admit that. They say, no, no, you don't leave the church. Well, then we should never have left the synagogues too. Or even the Lutheran Church. You know, they're just... I mean, all these church leaders teach them that they must stay in the church to be saved. I've got it in writing. I've got it on a video. It's on that Roman SDA page, too, by the way. And so, this 
when they do this, this place is a brick and mortar building and a denominational name over and above the sacrifice of Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago. Because think about it. They think if they leave the Seventh-day Adventist church, if they leave the Catholic church, they're going to go to hell. And so to them, what happened on Calvary is nowhere near as important as their creed and their denominational name. That's just where the rubber hits the road. I mean, at the end of the thousand years when that self-deception wipes away, that's got to be a blaring light of judgment upon them on that day when they find this, oh my, what did we do? You know, it's kind of like, ugh, I don't even want to think about that. That's just, I mean, this is what Satan has lured the Jews and the Catholics to believe salvation is by works, as well as the Buddhist, the Muslim, and the Hindu. And now that the end of, is near, all the Protestants believe the lie as well. And by the way, the prophetic statement made by Isaiah regarding the lip service of the people has been an issue with the people of God for eons. So much so that Jesus himself echoed the prophesied statement he gave Isaiah when he said what he said in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, right there. Okay, it's, he said, Jesus said this, he goes, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me teaching for the doctrines, the commandments of men. This is Roman Catholicism. This is the Baptist Church. This is the Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is all of them. The Word of God shows us often that mere profession of Christ is worthless when it is declared from a false heart. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We must understand that even when we pass the tests placed upon us by these many trials that are designed to burn off the dross, uh, the dross of our, uh, our sinful ways, so as, uh, so as to be ready for both the latter rain and then the new life, in you know eternal life in New Jerusalem, even then we must agree with Paul, who said in Philippians 3, verses 12 and 14, "Not as though I had already attained." Either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, for which also I am apprehended of Jesus of Christ Jesus. I'll explain this in a minute. Uh, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and re forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The word apprehend in this passage is translated from the Greek word, uh, what is this, uh, ketalambano, ketalambano, which is defined as take, comprehend, come upon, attain, find, and uh, obtain. You know, attain and obtain. And so, in other words, we must embrace Jesus Christ in all that He shows He has offered, or has offered unto us in His written word. He is Savior. Yes. And most, <laughs> you hear that? That's <laughs> my grand boy. It's, uh, he's trying to get in. <laughs> he's trying to figure out how to turn that knob, but he, you know, he ain't got there yet. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Jesus shows us that he has offered unto us in his written word everything. He is, he is Savior, yes, and most see him as such, but he is much more than that. And so the people in the apostate churches are taught to have a shallow view of him as Satan has moved every denomination on earth to view him in the last 2,000 years then they cannot apprehend or even understand anything Christ has to say in the way originally designed for them to understand in his word we need to remember that when Paul had been caught up to the third heaven according to 2 Corinthians 12 chapter, uh, yeah, chapter, uh, chapter 12 verses 4 to 6 did I forget to put that in here Oh, my. It's not in there. <laughs> Sorry. Well, Sean wants to throw it in the room. He can. But Second Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 6. He illustrates how that he was caught up into the th paradise and heard unspeakable words. You know, that kind of reminds me of the uh, the statements that uh, John was hearing and the angel told him, don't write it down. And, so, and, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for man to utter, of such and one. Boy, would you love to be able to hear those words? We're gonna when we get home, obviously, but man, I'm thinking it's a major key that unlocks a lot of the real meaty verses, you know? A major key of understanding and how to read this and how to read that. But anyway, 
He goes on to say that of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Yeah, so sure, Paul could have built a pedestal of pride and declared himself all worthy of exaltation for experience of the vision that he had in the third heaven, as well as being granted you know, wisdom from on high. But even though he saw and heard those unutterable things, he knew, as did Isaiah, long before him that he was undone. Any boasting now would be sheer foolishness because think about it. It wasn't a vision standing where he was and those things he saw and heard no doubt humbled him to the point wherein he knew to exalt himself would be sheer idiocy at best because the wisdom of heaven wherein there are no dark glasses on any resident of the city of our God that eternal reality made him realize he still stands undone in the flesh and so you can't seek self glory like so many out there do I bring this up because this ritualistic lip service taught by man does, does generate a desire to stand exalted and praised. And most are taught this from birth. I mean, this type of mindset will never be blessed. Yet in nearly every aspect of life we are taught to be prideful. Need I remind you of how every school has sporting events? You know, where the winner is praised and the loser is often shunned? Yeah, but they shun them in a nice way. You know, so as to make it all seem okay. But they're still a loser. It's just like with birthdays. That's why we don't do that. Oh, today, it's all about me. It's all about... And then the next day comes, hey, what happened? Everybody loved me yesterday. And that's how a little kid thinks. That's how a little kid is raised to think. One day, it's all about you. No, no it's not. It's kind of like going to a funeral on Sabbath. The Sabbath is supposed to, is supposed to be a day of rest. It's supposed to be about the Lord and the promises and creation, what he has done for us. But when you go to a funeral or a wedding, that day becomes all about the guy in the box or the girl in the dress. So the titles men use like Most High Reverend, which, by the way, is blasphemous because Holy uh, Reverend is thy name, saith the Lord. So it's just like you know, calling the Pope Holy Father. Same thing. It's blasphemous. And so the titles that men use, you know, like Reverend or President or first of equals or Lord God Pope confirms hands down that the flesh has become their God case in point did Peter call himself a, po a Pope did Paul call for president nope but even after seeing all that Paul saw that day in vision he still declared in Philippians 3 verse 12 yeah I got that one on screen <laughs> so he was not as though, uh, he, yeah, he says he was not, uh, no, it says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. Because he knows that's where he's headed. I follow after that prize. I go, I go forward in that direction. He, he saw and heard what he did, but that by no means made him perfect, and so he must still follow after the Lord and the Lord only as he continues on the path of life to make it to that perfection. In other words, Paul was no Baptist who believed once saved, always saved especially after he had that vision. Boy, you have a vision in the Catholic Church. You're a living saint, and they glow. Oh, man, I, I remember there was these two women I know back in the day that were uh, put up there on pedestals like you would not believe. But um, it's, just, uh, it's, it's, it's just a strange world. I just want to leave it at that. But um, maybe I should stop here because... Um, I'm not going to be able to, because if I keep going, I'm going to be going for another 10, 15 minutes, you know. And so, uh, looks like there's going to be part part five. <laughs> Who knows about, you know, the latter rain thing. So, this is a series. I didn't think it was going to go this long, but praise the Lord, because I'm already 45 minutes into what I'm thinking. Uh, I don't know why SoundForge does this, but it doesn't tell me the minutes uh, as I'm doing it, you know. It only does it as I'm editing it. And so, uh, but uh, let me just see here. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I don't know because I think I started at a quarter two. Yeah, good point, Kurt, brother Kurt. 
Amen. We're patient at Sabbath. What else you got to do? <laughs> really, I agree with you 100%. So let's move on then. Well, maybe another 10 minutes, huh? 10, 15 minutes? So, okay. All right. So amen, brothers and sisters. So, like I was saying, you guys are amazing. Praise the Lord. So Paul was no Baptist. You know, even after having the vision, he still didn't think, oh, I'm guaranteed heaven now. Look at me. Glow in the dark, Paul. And so, as we, we, we all see too often here on earth, Paul is exalted by some, as is Peter. And many of the patriarchs and prophets are also worshipped by some. Uh, the fact that the, the Pope calls or claims Peter was a Pope locks that one down, you know, in, 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 in the history, I mean. Uh, and, and when a man and a woman of God does, uh, you know, goes to rest in the grave, the people in their churches lift him up in high exaltation, as if they're they're to be worshipped and honored just for dying. Sadly, before death, most men, men and women of God, expect that sinful act of worship to be done for them in death while they're still alive. Some like to, you know, like Pharaoh, even set the stage well in advance of their deaths so that they're guaranteed a glorious funeral. You know, I knew, as a matter of fact. This is so sad when I think about it. I go back in time and think, because this guy, uh, he, I never knew he was SDA, this guy. His name was Ernie Hibbs. And, and I, I never knew the guy was SDA. He was a leader in the SDA church, in fact. And um, uh, he knew Pastor Russ, as a matter of fact. I met him in Pastor Russ's church, but he never let on that he was a Sabbath keeper. And I think he was doing it out of respect for Russ because... Uh, uh, he didn't uh, want to make it look like he was going to, you know, proselyze people out. But after I eventually left Russ's church because of some, you know, truths that uh, the Lord revealed, and uh, he would not, you know, Russ would not embrace, because uh, I was preaching you know, Sunday. I was still a Sunday keeper. I was preaching every Sunday at night. Uh, he wouldn't. Uh, sometimes he did give me the pulpit for the sermon hour but you, we went to church three times a week back then you know uh, Wednesdays for study and then twice on Sunday and uh, he used to, it was an open pulpit for Sunday and yeah I was always always there but it took me a, a year to get there because I had stage fright and I was afraid of uh, preaching error uh, it's a scary, that's why I always turn this fan on <laughs> I'm always heated up I'm always very concerned about what I'm saying I don't want to because uh, I may preach, an, like say if I preach an error, uh, I may lead someone off the path and they'll die and it'll be my fault. And so I, uh, I'm very, very careful. And many of you know, it, it, that have been around you for years, know that sometimes I do mess up and say something wrong or take something out of context. The following Sabbath, I'll get up there and I'll say, look, I messed up last week and here's where. And I'm not afraid to admit I'm wrong because I'm just a man just like the rest of us, you know. And so um, I knew this guy. He was an SDA preacher. He was named Ernie Hibbs. And uh, he was always, every now and then I'd see him once or twice every other month in the back of the church. He'd sit in the back pew, sometimes while I was preaching and sometimes when Russ was preaching. He usually came in the morning, so he rarely saw me preach. And so one day he found, and then all of a sudden after I left, he revealed himself to me and stopped by and we became really close uh, especially after I uh, started keeping Sabbath. So 10 years after I left the uh, Catholic Church, and this was uh, probably all of um, two years after I left Russ, no, be me one. Because as soon as we left the 1011 day house, when we moved away from, got us away from our brothers and, you know, my brethren, we, uh, six months later, we found out about the Sabbath. And then I remembered someone telling me that Ernie kept the Sabbath. And so I called him, and then bam we best buds uh, he's like in his 70s at the time and so he only lasted another 10 years and so he knew he was going to die one day he had some funny ideas too but then again that's seven day Adventism you know he had some strange ideas especially telling his son it was okay to kill a baby because the baby had Down syndrome and this is still a baby you know so he had a problem there but uh, and I, I told him about it and he understood it but um uh, he made sure, when he found out he was dying, he made sure to contact everyone he knew that would speak highly of him at his funeral. He wanted them to attend. He didn't mention me preaching, but he did say he needed me to be there. 
because maybe he thought the Holy Spirit was going to move me and I was going to get up there and say some wonderful things about him. And so, But he made sure certain men would promise to speak. And yes, while sitting there waiting my chance, I was tempted to do so as well. I almost got up and spoke. Uh, but then it started getting really difficult uh, because uh, he was an ex-Marine and uh, they did this, you know, 21 gun salute. And that just that just hit it off for me, you know, like with everything else that was being said and done. And, and I miss the guy because I love him. And I just, I, I couldn't hold back the tears. They just started flowing. But that's not why I got up on the uh, the pulpit. It's something I found later at the Lord. I, I, I know now why the Lord sealed my lips that day. Uh, can anyone forget how all living presidents knelt before the dead body of Pope John Paul II in 2005 when he was laying on that cold slab and it was on an angle they had a big block of ice with an air conditioner on it and I got pictures of it on the website somewhere all of the living presidents were kneeling on kneelers in front of that dead body as Paul illustrates even if we see all and hear all that is proclaimed from on high Come on, he was in heaven, right? And when that latter rain falls, we are going to have wisdom no man can imagine, as well as faith and perfect utterance for those we speak to, because it's prophesied. They're going to understand every word we say when it comes to the mark of the beast. That's why Satan appears and force in an enforce of Sunday laws to try to shut us up because we're emptying well not us, but the truth we present is emptying the churches. And a lot of Christians are dying now because, you know uh, just look now, they're killing people because they don't wear a mask. If they tell everybody on the planet that uh if you keeping if you don't keep Sunday holy, you're gonna cause the entire planet to die and all of us on it and they'll have I mean think about it. they've gotten them believing that a common cold will kill you. COVID nineteen, or, or or just like a flu, like a like it's a light. It's a ninety. It's still ninety nine point nine percent of the people that get going to survive it, and ninety nine point seven percent if you're over seventy. But they've got everybody believing it's deadly to the point some people are getting persecuted and killed because they won't go along. Do you think they're going to be wanting to kill us when the, you know, when the buy and sell thing goes down, and we refuse to keep Sunday holy? And they're thinking you're going to kill everybody, my wife, my kids, everybody on this planet because you don't. Yeah, it's not going to be an easy road to hoe, but at the same time, <laughs> well, that rains on us, and so there's not going to be any fear. <sighs> but think about that. We're going to have perfect utterance, absolute discernment, perfect faith, wisdom, everything, everything we need, miracles. We're going to do. We're going to ask the Lord to do things. He's going to do things for for us to glorify Him more than He did for the apostles. Why? Because the latter rain falls more abundantly. And if we have a prideful heart in any way, shape, or form that says, "Hey, look at me, man! I got the rain," that rain's never going to. You're not going to get a single drop. Hence, the reason for your ails right now, brother and sister. He knows who He wants to get wet with that rain. But if you can't handle this or handle that, you're not going to be able to handle it. You know, because even then, when we are blessed, as we are soon to be blessed, like the prophet Isaiah and Paul himself, we're still undone. Even in heaven, a trillion years from now, we still don't know it all. Although there's theologians down here that claim to know it all, but we are nowhere near where we need to be so as to be able to stand side by side with any resident of New Jerusalem. And so we strive day by day in the hopes of receiving the latter rain, wherein we can have that blessing most alive will never attain or even comprehend. Still, even then, we will only receive the rain when we know how unworthy we are to receive it in the first place. Because as Paul said, yet of myself will, I will not glory, but in mine infirmities, right? I praise God for the fact I can't memorize anymore. That means John 14, uh, John fourteen twenty six has to be, that promise has to be real, and it has been. And the Lord showed me many, you know, about three or four, about three decades ago, on the street, how He will bring all things to my remembrance, whatsoever He has told me. But if I don't read the Bible daily, then I forget what He told me. You know, the minute we declare ourselves worthy of that glory, we become the full that lures all men to join them in self-glory, 
like the popes, the prelates, and the blasphemous preachers that call themselves reverend. And, and, and this is why we see dead popes and prelates paraded before the people as if they are literally gods on earth. For that is how far self-deception can grow. In that even though the Pope is displayed as a dead and speechless corpse in front of everybody on camera, no less, the leaders of the so-called free world under the spell of self-glory, because they want to be glorified too. Man, if I don't kneel down in front of this dead body, they ain't going to do it for mine. So I'm going to kneel. I don't know that's got to be going through either Clinton's head, Carter's head, Bush's head, and the other Bush. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the dad was still alive at the time. And uh, who else was? I think that was it. You know, Jimmy Carter was the oldest one there. And so, he still is. He's still alive. He's in his 90s. And, and so, they kneel before him in worship, even as he his body rots right in front of their eyes. I don't care how cold it is. He wasn't frozen solid. Because they just had him on a slab. Today, the norm is to worship popes, prelates, first of equals, presidents, and even the apostate leaders on the pulpit. And this is why every single soul in the apostate churches will never receive the latter rain when it falls. Nary a one of them. To these leaders and followers of man, I echo this call to repentance by Jeremiah. What he said back thousands of years ago, it's in Jeremiah chapter 3. Right there, it's okay. It's still on. Oops. Yeah, okay. Je Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. It says, Lift up thine eyes onto the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness. And thou hast polluted the land with any, with thy, rather, with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withholden. And there hath been no latter rain. And thou hadst a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Come on, all the churches, including the SDA church, are following after the whore of Babylon. They have made the decision. The decisions are made in the forehead. That's where you get the mark of the beast if you make the decision to go ahead and keep sunny holy. If you're forced into keeping the sunny holy because they'll take away your ability to buy and sell or work, that prophetic symbol, right hand, the ability to do work. That's why some people will get it in the right hand. But the leaders of all the 501c3 churches, they have all joined hands with the Babylonian harlot and the second beast in the USA for worldly gain. Because you cannot get a 501c3 unless you incorporate, or in layman's terms, incorporation means to join your church with the state. And the state is federal. Not just the, the, you know, like uh, the one of the 50, which they're planning to make 51, because finally the District of Columbia is going to be an actual state in America. They're, they're talking about this. Yesterday I saw an article about it. And so anyway, the, the second beast of Revelation is, of course, the USA. To incorporate means to join your church with that state, and that state is, of course, the United States. So the, leader, the leaders... Act like spiritual prostitutes, waiting for someone to offer them political powers as they bow in worship of, of the mother harlot. Just like he said here, he, he, uh, they sit and wait like the Arabian in the wilderness. The fallen leaders have clearly turned the churches into demonic cesspools, all the while shamelessly embracing all that Rome has to offer. And for this, yeah, the latter rain's not going to fall on them. Can't. They polluted the land with their whoredoms and thy wickedness. But even they can repent. True, there is little time left to do so, just as a thief on the cross found, but God's mercy is still available. He's God. He's not a tyrant. And by the way, as I was doing my studies Thursday morning, where in one of the books I w I'm in is uh, Daniel, I came across something that the babes and the scoffers need to understand pretty clearly here. <clears throat> when it comes to the 501c3 churches and the ministries of the world. The obedient people of God knew of this prophesied event, understanding that the prophetic warning of both Daniel and Revelation regarding a church and state power in Rome and an image to that church and state power in the USA. Because we know the USA is the second beast. First beast is the church and state power, the Vatican. 
I praise the Lord that years later, when I came across Spirit of Prophecy, that not that she not just she didn't just confirm what I understood from Scripture. Many others were confirmed, you know, prophecies by who I and everyone in the Seventh Day Remnant Church knows to be a prophet named Ellen White. We all know this. She stated something over 120 years ago. And, and, and when I saw this the first time, she wrote it in 1899. Manuscript releases, I think it is. Or no, I don't know. It's MS. Brother Mel, what's that? <laughs> I'm lousy with the initials here. I'm good with the initials of the scripture because that's where I cut my teeth. But, you know, I'm still a, I consider myself still a novice with all my writings, I got to tell you. She wrote so much. But anyway, she said this over 120 years ago. And now that we are so close to the end, when even the most hidden evils of our church and government leaders are out in the open, what she says here cannot be mistaken by even those that do not see her as a prophet. For she made it very clear what we see happening with the way the 501c3 churches echo whatever the second beast of the USA confirms that they have to echo. Whatever the like, be politically correct. If we say homosexual marriage is okay, you got to say it too from the pulpit. We got a video of SDAs doing it, SDA leaders in Loma Linda, no less, saying they they agree with homosexual marriage, and then they say, oh no no, we just let the homosexuals come into the church and then we tell them their lifestyle is wrong. How do you get around the other one? How do you get around it when your your pastor of this Loma Linda is telling them you can get married, and we'll help you get this law passed in California? They're hypocrites. They do. It's just like with Roman Catholicism. They'll say something locally in, in the public arena, totally different. That way they can say, oh, look, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that, that preach or that priest, rather. Yeah, he's a little bit of a problem child for the church, and so we don't really go along with him, right? But privately they, they'll, they'll say something, you know, to you and, and lock it down into the confusion there. That way they always have an out. Because there's so many priests, they all don't believe the same way. Well, then they shouldn't be in the church. Don't just sit there and use them as an excuse to push forth Balderall. you got to kick them out of the church. Well, SDAs do the exact same thing now. Yeah, I don't agree with uh, Dwight Nelson. No, I don't agree with Ted Wilson. Or I, I don't agree with uh, you know Mark Finley, and he says that, or Doug Batcher, what he said over there. Uh, but I still think you should uh, you know, be SDA. And they're all 501c3, all of them. I mean, Doug Batcher's got three of them, three 501c3s. But check this out. Let me scroll down for you there, because it's the uh, the bottom one there. It's just manuscript? Okay, so manuscript releases is okay. Yeah, it's MR. Okay. Thanks, uh, brother. Okay, so Ellen White said this. She said this uh, regarding the New World Order and the image of the beast 120 years ago, 1899. All right? Or is that 122 years? I don't know. You do the math. So, she said, the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft. Yeah, we could just stop there. <laughs> it's 501c3. Church and state, right? But let's go on. She says, the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. You know what that's talking about, right? That dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, you know, ten toes mixed with iron and clay. That's the 501c3. All right. This union is weakening all the power of the churches, just as Satan planned. And it was prophesied. Daniel saw it. Well, Nebuchadnezzar saw it. So, anyway, uh, this investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. And what are some of these evil results? Well, they now say Allah is God. On camera, Dwight Nelson did a whole sermon about it. As a matter of fact, 3ABN contacted me and asked me to remove my video where I showed Dwight Nelson saying Allah is God and then John Carter did it years later but they never contacted me on John Carter because they knew I wasn't going to remove the video they asked me to remove the video I says okay I'll do it not a problem but you can, you, you have to literally go on camera and we can't and declare unto everybody on camera, this is your duty. I've done it a few times when I messed up on a pulpit. you got to get up there and tell the people you messed up. That never should have been allowed to have been aired. Allah is not God. And the man said, uh, you know, we can't do that. I says, well, then the video stays up. they got to be politically correct. 
And what are some of the other evils? Well, homosexual marriage is okay. Abortion is okay. Can you believe it? They literally state in writing in this Seventh-day Adventist church, you can kill your child to help lower population. They say women can be installed, uh, ordained as pastors and leaders in the church. It's just, it goes on and on and on. I mean, I got a whole website all about this called sdaapostasy.org. That's the reason for the site. Well, actually, well, I don't want to get into that. So anyway, she goes on to say that men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. 1899 again, right? Don't forget. They invested their strength in politics. Hmm. Remember the video? I did two videos about Ben Carson. Brain surgeon Ben Carson. Seventh-day Adventist Ben Carson. Leader in the church Ben Carson. General Conference never told him, don't do that. You can't run for president. And then when, of course, he failed miserably there because uh, he, uh, you know, he, he wasn't their plan, uh, he got some other office. I can't remember the name of his office, but he is a legal bought and paid for literally bought and paid for politician right now. He is a politician. That's what that's just the truth. And then he was also asked a question on camera about what would you put first? Like if someone said, You gotta do this when you know the Bible says oh well, yeah, the Constitution says like if the Constitution says you for you to do something when you know it's directly against the scriptures, what do you declare to be? It's a simple answer, yes or no. Would the Constitution be held up or would the scriptures be held up and he goes that's not a simple question and I made a video of, whoa why is that vibrating I meant, oh I got a magnetic thing on there bouncing around I uh, I made a video of, uh, all, all about that and uh, boy just everybody that chimed in on the comments said that uh, yeah it was an easy question for them to answer no the Bible's first but he doesn't want to lose his chances to become president because that's around the time that he was asked this question and then of course some of the other evils are that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has dozens of Sunday keeping churches and they keep pagan holy days and so but uh, continuing where she left off she again she says they have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy but the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will recoil upon themselves. If you're in a 501c3 church, and right right now, 100% of the churches, including the SCA church, are in fact under a 501c3 contract, just like Prophecy said. They have to create that image to the beast in Rome, and that's what they've done. We are that close to the end. We're going to be going out in a loud cry. I would imagine you can count the years that are left on your hand with fingers left over. If you are still in this church, this 501c church, when that latter rain falls, you will not be blessed with that refreshing. And you will not be used to the Lord to go forth in loud cry because he simply cannot trust you to do anything that he would have you do because you ignored him when he said in Revelation 18, verses 4 to 5. Let me scroll up for you there. There it is. He said, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached, high, have reached unto heaven. And God hath remembered her iniquities. Only those, I'll close with this, only those that obey will be given eyes that see and hearts filled with love and wisdom from on high in these days. And when the letter goes out, we know our Father's will because we are his children and we can hear his voice quite clearly. With that, I offer a ray of hope and truth from our future home in heaven it is found in James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. It says, be patient. Are you praying for something that you've been waiting on for years? Be patient. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. He's being patient too, you know. He's waiting on us. He can't let the rain fall till we're ready. And so, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it. It's early. 6,000 years he's been waiting on his people. And so until let me backtrack a little bit. So for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another. 
Okay? Brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the or standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. And then verse 11 says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And I hope and pray you are blessed again on this Sabbath day.